Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the penultimate uh, talk in the Key or Physics Lecture Programme. Uh, thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us. As you can probably see from the uh, the picture in the background at the moment, uh, this evening's lecture or talk is being given by uh, Alan Simpson, uh, who is a, a nuclear physicist at uh, the National Nuclear Laboratory. Um, I will let you read the abstract there very quickly for those that haven't seen it already. But in essence, Alan's going to be talking tonight about the nuc about nuclear data. Uh, so he's going to start all the way from the, the, the workings of a nuclear reactor and talk about the big data challenge. So I've seen a few names in the list. Welcome to the computational scientists, certainly a few of them at Keel. Thank you for turning up. I think you'll find this as equally interesting as us physicists this evening. And before I do hand over to Alan to make a start, I'd just like to bring your attention to the fact that I said this is the penultimate lecture. And if you are an old fashioned filofax or pen and paper, now is the time to make a note of the fact that the 18th of March is our final lecture of the programme. It's not the final one ever, hopefully. I'm sure it won't be, but it will be for this particular programme. And that talk will be given by uh, Rosella Bonetti of Ansaldo Enigir. Uh, and again, uh, this one is similarly based, nuclear based, but on uh, SMR led called fast reactors. So again, if you've got colleagues or friends that might be in the field or interested, please do make a note of that now. Um, and the registration link is there on the screen. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm going to let Alan introduce himself. But firstly, Alan, welcome to the Keel Physics uh, Lecture Centre. We really appreciate you coming and giving up your time this evening to give us this fantastic talk. Um, just for those that haven't attended before, we tend to take questions at the end. Uh, please do use the question and chat function within GoToWebinar. Alan himself won't see them because of the setup, but I will, and I shall compare them to him at the end as they come in. The final point I would like to make, and again, I would like to thank Stephen, Stephen Bostock, who's our uh, BSL interpreter this evening. Um, he's going to be interpreting throughout the presentation, but for Stephen's benefit, we will be taking a short five minute break halfway through. Um, it'll be pretty obvious, Alan informs him when that will be. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us. I hope your glasses or your mugs are filled. And I'm now gonna pass over to Alan, um, for a lovely evening's lecture. So Alan, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm gonna pass over to you. Great, thanks Scott. Just wait, I haven't got the link to share my screen yet. Okay, just bear with you should have it now, yeah, brilliant. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for your, your time this evening and uh, uh, and coming to, to listen. Uh, as Scott has uh, said, I want to speak to you tonight about uh, an introduction to nuclear data, and I've called it the original big data challenge. Uh, and I'll come back to that theme a couple of times through tonight's talk. Uh, but first, uh, a bit about myself. I studied physics at the University of Exeter about a decade ago now, which uh, I always deny to myself is shorter than it actually is. Uh, and uh, for the past four and a half years, uh, I've worked at the National Nuclear Laboratory uh, based up at the Sellafield Reprocessing Plant in West Cumbria as a nuclear physicist. Uh, and uh, I often get asked, what is uh, being a nuclear physicist at the National Nuclear Laboratory? What does that involve? Uh, and uh, my, my flippant answer always has to come back. Well, if it's related to nuclear and it's got physics in it, then we'll probably do something related to it. Uh, I'm really lucky to work across a massive wide range of projects. Uh, but one of the, the core areas uh, that we work in as a team is in spent nuclear fuel inventories. And I'll talk a bit more about what a spent nuclear fuel inventory is and how that works later on in tonight's talk, uh, but also in some of the applications of nuclear technology in the future. So it becomes a really wide ranging uh, uh, opportunity. And as part of that, one of the uh, projects I currently uh, work on and lead it is this AFCP nuclear data project. Uh, and AFCP, uh, the Advanced Fuel Cycle Programme, is a Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy sponsored project. Uh, that is looking to uh, boost the research and development in advanced nuclear fuel cycles in the UK. Uh, and I'll get onto a bit more detail about that again in, in a moment. You probably haven't heard of uh, the National Nuclear Laboratory before. Uh, so just a, a brief summary of, of, of who we are and what we do. Uh, we are the UK's National Nuclear Laboratory uh, for fission nuclear 
uh, technology, uh, but we operate in quite a unique commercial model. So we work on an autonomous commercial basis is what it's described as. We are a UK government owned company that gets no UK government funding. It is an interesting uh, uh, combination uh, of the, the two different roles, but it actually allows us to fulfill roles as a technical advisor to the UK government. Uh, it allows us to support the commercial operation of nuclear facilities around the UK and internationally, and also to deliver national strategic technical work of which AFCP is a part. The company has uh, something like over 10,000 person years of nuclear industry experience uh, across the whole of the nuclear fuel cycle. Uh, again, I'll touch upon the nuclear fuel cycle later. Uh, and uh, we operate from about six locations uh, across the UK, uh, really unique facilities within Europe even, uh, some of the facilities we operate, which allow us to go and uh, cut up and in investigate and examine uh, fuel coming out of the back of nuclear reactors. Uh, uh, and we do that on a routine basis uh, for reactors across the UK. So uh, to the subject of tonight's talk, uh, what is uh, big data? I thought I'd uh, start with that question uh, when I was uh, faced with, with putting this talk together. Uh, and uh, like any sensible physicist, I went straight to my primary source of uh, scratching my head about anything. And I thought, well, what's someone put in Wikipedia? Uh, and uh, the first uh, sentence on big data in Wikipedia is big data is a field that treats ways to analyze, systematically extract information from or otherwise deal with data sets that are too large or complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing application software. And then I was sort of considering this uh, and considering the work we do on nuclear data and started to realize that the work we do on nuclear data deals with uh, a massive data set extracting information from tens of years of experiments uh, to be able to provide meaningful input to other computational processes that allow us to apply stuff in the real world. And that's why I claim tonight that nuclear data is the original big data challenge. Nuclear data research uh, dates back to the, the early years of the nuclear industry. It, it really goes back to Rutherford splitting the atom and it goes back to understanding the probabilities behind what happens in, in nuclear interactions. Uh, but before I start getting into the detail of, of what nuclear data is and uh, uh, how it comes together and how we build it and how we use it to, to underpin what happens in the nuclear fuel cycle, uh, I thought I'd sort of start with really why this affects us uh, on a day to day basis. Uh, and to do that, uh, I uh, went to uh, a classic American comedy. Not quite a classic, but definitely an American comedy. Uh, and I always remember this scene out of Young Sheldon that you may have seen before. So, uh, as Sheldon found out in the, that clip, uh, within all of our houses, we've probably got some smoke detectors that are preventing uh, and warning us uh, about fire uh, uh, to, to keep us safe uh, every day. And um, most smoke detectors uh, that we buy now and nowadays are called ionization uh, smoke detectors. Uh, and what that means is they have a small amount of radioactive material within them. Uh, that ionizes, so allows the air to move around a charged uh, 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 atmosphere within the smoke detector, such that when smoke particles uh, move about within the air, it changes the uh, rate of uh, charge movement, obviously changes the current within that smoke detector uh, and can trip the, the detector and the alarm. 
uh, the particles, the, the radioactive source that is used is americium-241, uh, which releases uh, alpha particles that cause ionization. But the question is, how can we be sure that we've got enough americium-241 to ionize the air for the detector to work without having so much as to cause harm to anyone near it? And the answer to that is where nuclear data comes in. Nuclear data provides us with all the fundamental physical parameters uh, that we require to do these calculations, such as how far does uh, an alpha particle travel in air? How much uh, alpha particles are generated from some americium-241 within the detector? And that allows us to design how much protection we need to put around that little bit of americium-241. Uh, and uh, uh, how much americium-241 we need. Uh, and so uh, the, the work of, of nuclear data allows us to develop these safety devices that are completely innocuous in the home. And uh, to rest assured there, uh, if you uh, know the episode, you'll know that Sheldon goes on to get about 50 smoke detectors from a smoke detector company. And the end result is the FBI coming to investigate the garage. Uh, like any good physicist, I, uh, I got my calculator out and uh, did a, a back of the envelope calculation. Uh, and he is a few smoke detectors off a nuclear reactor. Uh, by my estimates, we're looking at somewhere around 70 to 100 million smoke detectors to have enough radioactive material uh, to actually produce an operational nuclear reactor. Uh, so we can see we're operating at a much smaller scale uh, than, than in reactors. But that does then pose the question of, of, of what's going on inside a reactor and how does that scale up to a reactor uh, for us to be able to, to calculate what's happening and essentially start to calculate how much material we need to run a nuclear reactor. Now to do this, I think it's important to, to help you understand what is going on in a nuclear reactor. Uh, and I was searching around for sort of some, some useful videos that I could speak over to, to explain what's happening inside a nuclear reactor. Uh, and I realised that it's, it's quite a challenge because I could easily spend the next six hours talking about the detail of what's going on inside a nuclear reactor, uh, by which point uh, you would have all long logged off and I'd be happily chatting away to my laptop. Uh, but what I did come across is a, is a great video that explains the operation of a nuclear reactor in about three to four minutes, far more succinctly than I can. So I'm going to hand over to uh, uh, Jem Stansfield from uh, the uh, Bango's The Theory show from a few years ago uh, and let him explain a bit more about what's going on. Alan, just so you're aware, um, we can't hear this. So is it possible just to get the sound on at all? Uh, try that. A big problem. As we saw in the video, uh, what's happening inside a nuclear reactor is uh, millions upon millions upon millions of individual events within the nuclear fuel. And this is where the nuclear data becomes important uh, because uh, inside those fuel rods, inside those fuel pins, neutrons are causing the continuous fission of uranium-235 atoms. But the heat generation in the core is more complicated because it isn't simply those atoms knocking into each other that causes the heat generation. What we actually have is you have a number of processes happening within the atoms and probabilities of those different processes. So, for example, if we look at the diagram of the atom on the right here, we've got our U-235 nucleus in the centre. Uh, and we could see from different atoms alpha decay, beta decay, uh, gamma emission, which you uh, probably are uh, uh, familiar with, or fission events where we get the splitting of the particle into two. Now, different nuclides have different probabilities of each of those events happening. So what we have to understand is how many of each of the different nuclides we have within the reactor core. But within a reactor core, we have around about 100 tonnes of nuclear fuel. So that's 100 tonnes of uranium dioxide fuel, which means we've got uh, uranium and, and the two oxygen atoms, obviously. Uh, and 
In most reactors nowadays, we enrich that to about 4% enrichment. So that means 4% of our uranium are these uranium-235 atoms. But it also means we have 96% uranium-238 atoms. We've got lots of oxygen atoms in there. And we've got all those other materials within the reactor, all of the steels, the zirconium alloy cladding that sits around the outside of that fuel to protect it. Uh, and all of those different materials within the reactor have an effect on how the neutrons travel. And as Jem Stansfield uh, mentioned in the video, uh, the neutrons have to be going at specific speeds to encourage uh, and cause fission. Uh, and the, the, the amount of fission is, uh, affects whether we get critical. Now, all these radiation pathways affect the heat generation in a reactor. So fission generates heat through uh, processes such as after we fission, not only do we have the kinetic energy of those two uh, fission elements, but we also have a significant gamma release. We have something called prompt gamma release. Most of the heat energy released in a fission event is from that prompt gamma release. Uh, a minimal amount is from that the kinetic energy of that fission. Uh, and the number of different events going on with that affects how much heat we uh, are dumping into the centre of the fuel. Uh, and then we have certain materials properties which affect how quickly that heat dissipates to the edge of the fuel and into the moderator and coolant flowing around it, uh, the water that sat there. And so all these multiple factors are important to help us design that reactor. But we have to come back to the nuclear data to start thinking about how can we treat this at a holistic scale such that we can design the reactor. Because what we can't do is try and uh, work out what's gonna happen after every single event. If every single event is a probability, we need to start thinking at the scale of the millions upon millions upon millions of events happening every second. Uh, and for context, uh, in the space of a, about a cubic centimeter within the center of a reactor, every second we have approximately a thousand billion billion fission events and neutrons flying about. It's a thousand billion billion fission events and neutrons flying about every second. So because we've got so many events, what we can actually start to do is treat this as a macro problem and a far wider problem. Uh, and we can start using the probabilities to do some calculations. And one of the key calculations we do is looking at the four factor formula. Uh, and this produces something called K infinity. K infinity uh, is the measure of whether we are critical, supercritical, which means we are generating more fission events uh, than happened before, and therefore the rate of our nuclear reaction is increasing, uh, and uh, we are potentially losing control of the reaction, or subcritical, where the rate of fission events is lower than the, the uh, incoming events and therefore our reaction is dying off. We want to operate the reactor at critical. Uh, once we get up to, to operational speed, we want to be at about a K infinity of one, which means for every one fission event, it induces about one more fission event. And to do that, we're combining factors such as the number of neutrons that are streaming out of the reactor core the number of neutrons that are slowed down to the right speed such that they may induce fission, the probability that a neutron of the right speed will induce fission, uh, or the probability that a neutron is going to be captured in some other process in the meantime. So uh, at that point, uh, I'm going to suggest we stop for uh, our five minute break uh, and after we come back from the break, uh, we're, I'm going to talk to you a bit more about what happens when those nuclides fission and what the nuclear data tells us about what, what is happening in the core. Thank you, Alan. Yes, so if everybody wants to go and top up their, their mugs or their glasses, in the meantime, if anybody does have any questions at this point, please feel free to post them using the questions function. Um, otherwise, I will look forward to receiving them towards the end of the lecture. So in, in, enjoy your comfort break and we will return again in five minutes. Thank you. Um, 
I think that's perfect timing. So, Alan, with no further ado, we're going to hand back to you um, and let's enjoy the second half of the talk. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, so, uh, over the, the past 20 minutes or so, uh, you're probably thinking, we haven't talked too much about data uh, and stuff, and he's, he spent a lot, on, lot of time talking about nuclear reactors. Uh, and hopefully now, uh, the stuff I'm going to talk to you about in the next uh, half of the presentation will start to make more sense in, in the context of how we operate and run a nuclear reactor. So I talked just before the, the, the short break uh, about what's happening when we fire that neutron at the uranium-235 nucleus and what happens to the nucleus. And one of the key parameters that we have to understand is something called fission yield. And fission yield is telling us what we're going to create. Uh, and you're probably not going to be surprised by now about how much I've talked about probability, that this is another set of probabilities. We don't know exactly what that interaction will create. What we actually have is a fission yield, and uh, you'll see on the right hand side of this screen, the, the, the fundamental data plotted is a probability of creating uh, different particles uh, at various mass numbers. Uh, so these mass numbers range from mass number uh, 70 through to about 160, 165. We have two peak ranges and you get two particles coming out of a fission uh, and they don't tend to be the same size. What we see here, we, kind of, we talk about the M, the M of the fission yield curve. So if the fission yield I got from a reaction was uh, two particles of exactly the same size, uh, the probability of that happening is shown down here. Now, this is a logarithmic graph that I'm showing you. So about a thousand times more likely it is that I get uh, two particles uh, that are approximately uh, 50 uh, mass numbers apart. So that's about 50 uh, protons and neutrons uh, apart. And it's the size of those uh, fission yields that affects how many neutrons are released uh, after my reaction and almost also how much energy is released. Uh, you may remember uh, from an A-level physics course, uh, we have the uh, binding energy per nucleon curve and the binding energy per nucleon uh, goes uh, down, uh, goes up uh, as we get to the, the higher mass number uh, particles. Uh, and so as we uh, break out into uh, a couple of different particles, we get a certain amount of energy excess which is released. And that's the energy excess that, that Jem was talking about in the video. So this affects the heat and neutron generation in the reactor and affects how the reactor operates. And as I said before, we've got somewhere around uh, 10 to the 16. So that's about a thousand billion billion neutrons flying about in just a square centimeter of a reactor every second. So we can start to see those trends. But to understand these trends and understand the data that, that binds these together and all those different what we call channels of interaction and a different channel is a different probability of something happening. For example, a neutron hitting an atom uh, and releasing a gamma emission or an alpha particle or a beta particle. We consider each of those to be a channel of reactions. We have to do some experiments. And when I say some experiments, I mean quite a lot of experiments. The table on the right here is a list of the core experimental data that is used to create what are called nuclear data libraries. And it's these libraries that allow us to calculate all these parameters. There are around 24 to 25,000 different experiments that are recorded in this library, uh, and they cover around 70 to 80 years of experimental data that has been collected. About 50% of those experiments are focused on what are called cross sections, and the cross section is the direct probability uh, that an incoming uh, particle, most likely a neutron, but potentially a proton or an electron, is going to hit a nucleus and cause some sort of interaction. An interaction could be that the, neutr the neutron causes the nucleus to fission, it could be that it causes it to release a gamma emission, it could be that it causes release to alpha emission, it could cause all many sorts of things. But there's 24,000 of these experiments uh, and a lot of them uh, uh, start life as some pretty interesting experimental rigs and that's what I'm going to talk to you a bit about uh, through the, the next part of the talk. 
is what some of these experiments look like. And the, the one that's, I think, always interesting to start with is an experiment that is known as Lady Godiva, uh, which is based out in the US. Uh, and there have been various versions of Lady Godiva. But Lady Godiva is what is known as a critical benchmark experiment. And what that means is we're attempting to work out how much, in this case, uranium-235, we need to bring together in a certain shape to make a critical reaction. So that's where we're taking our K infinity above one. And you'll see what we've got here is we've got three bits of, and this is actually uranium metal held in a big stand. So we've got a bit of uranium metal here, a bit of uranium metal here, and a bit here. Uh, this is in a heavily shielded room. Uh, everyone in the room uh, leaves the room. And what we do is we bring uh, this uh, bottom part of the sphere and this top part of the sphere closer towards it. And what we're looking to measure is the point where the sphere goes critical. The point where the sphere goes critical, a significant amount of neutrons are going to start being released at a very rapid rate uh, from this system. And we have lots of detectors around the outside to detect those neutrons. And that starts to help us understand the uh, likelihood of interaction at that macro scale that I talked about before. So in nuclear data, we're trying to un, uh, fit empirical, so uh, experimental based evidence to quite complex maps. The maths around the interaction probabilities of particles with nuclei is complex and uh, poorly understood. So most of the data that we use to build our reactors on is actually based on experimental data collected. And that's what we're aiming to do within the advanced fuel cycle program. Uh, this, this phase program is because we're looking to build uh, uh, advanced fuel cycles and novel fuels for reactors. We're aiming to make sure we've got the data that allows us to understand how those will perform. So I thought I'd show you some pictures of actually some of the experiments we're involved in uh, with the, the, this program. Uh, and these are measuring uh, a couple of uh, different things. So I'm going to start with the experiment on the left. This is an experiment that is happening down in London. And in this case, what we're trying to measure is the cross-section of fission. Uh, so that's the likelihood that a neutron is going to hit into a, uh, a in this case, uranium-238 or uranium-236 target and cause fission. And so what we have here is we have actually a, a neutron accelerator facility that is going to fire a number of neutrons down this pipe into this chamber uh, and a number of detectors around this chamber uh, that are going to detect the uh, uh, fission uh, going, the, the fission fragments going through some charged plates. Now when the fission fragments are released, uh, they are charged uh, nucle uh, nuclei. Uh, and so they pass through some uh, metal plates and uh, causing a charge to register, uh, which is then recorded and analyzed uh, post experimentation to start working out the probability uh, of interaction, because we have a very good understanding of the number of neutrons that have been fired out of the accelerator. In the experiment on the right, uh, this is an experiment that actually was performed out at the CERN facility. Uh, and uh, something that a lot of people don't realise about at CERN uh, in, in Switzerland is that it is a significant contributor to nuclear data experiments. And nuclear data affects a, a large number of things in, in our, our world, which I will touch upon a bit, uh, a bit later as well. So this takes one of the beam lines coming out of the CERN uh, facility and it fires it into this uh, system here. And on the next slide, I've got a diagram of this system. And what we have is, uh, again, neutrons firing firing up here. And this is uh, known as a neutron time of flight facility. Uh, so it has uh, neutrons that have a very well known uh, time between being released and hitting a certain detector. And within the middle of this detector, we have a fission source at some point. So again, that will be a piece of uranium-238 or uranium-235 or maybe plutonium. Uh, and it hits there uh, and it causes fission. Uh, and we have a, a few events that go off in that case. First is we have uh, some the fission fragments uh, are thrown off and the laws of conservation of momentum 
uh, force them to go in opposite directions uh, and the, there's a likelihood that one will go down this way and one will go down this way into those ionization chambers. Obviously not all of them will go that way but some of them will. But then around the edge here we have a set of sodium iodide detectors and what they're measuring is the gamma release uh, after fission and I, as I mentioned earlier it's that gamma release which is the main driver of heating within nuclear fuel. So in this instance, what we're trying to do is make measurements that allow us to more accurately model the heat generation of nuclear fuel. Because at an atomistic level, we have only a limited understanding of the heat generation. Uh, and where we have a limited understanding of the data, what it means is we have to increase the safety margins when we design and build, in our case, reactors. And safety margins uh, uh, add cost to the build of reactors. So this is why it becomes of particular interest to the nuclear industry. But what becomes more important in our case is, as I mentioned, in the advanced fuel cycle programme, we're looking at novel fuels uh, and different fuels to what's been used in reactors before. For example, rather than the uranium dioxide fuel that is currently used in most reactors around the world, uh, we're starting to look at how uranium nitride fuel can be used. Uranium nitride fuel offers a number of uh, mechanical and engineering advantages uh, in terms of the fact that it uh, has better thermal heat conductivity, which means the heat is carried away from the centre line of the fuel quicker, uh, and therefore in an accident scenario, uh, which we're always designing for, but uh, planning to not happen, but we'd have to make sure we design it to, for the systems to be protected and cope in those accident scenarios. Uh, in an accident scenario, it means that the heat is dissipated from the fuel quicker, which reduces the likelihood of a core meltdown or a core partial meltdown event. But uranium nitride fuel starts to use new materials, new materials that we haven't used in significant amounts in the reactor before. And so therefore we have to start looking at the nuclear data life cycle to start to collect the data that will allow us to accurately model the fuel uh, to the point where we can make a justification to our regulators that the fuel is safe to put in the reactor. And to do that, we implement something called the nuclear data life cycle. And this is where we start to manage that big data challenge that I talked about before. On the right of this screen, I've got a screenshot of a, a system called Janus, which is the Java Nuclear Information System, which is released by uh, an executive agency of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD. Uh, and it's uh, the Nuclear Energy Agency is the, the agency underneath it. And this collects together a lot of the nuclear data that we have processed uh, around the world. And you can start to get a sense of the scale of the amount of data we're dealing with in this instance. This is just a snapshot of something called the chart of the nuclides. So you're probably familiar with the, uh, the periodic table uh, and those uh, 100 or so elements across the periodic table. But we also know that there are different isotopes of those different elements. And when we spread all those isotopes out into the, the different nuclides, that we have across, we get something called the chart of the nuclides. Chart of the nuclides uh, has around two to two and a half thousand nuclides identified on it. So that's a significant number more nuclides uh, that we have in the reactor. I remember being down at the uh, IOP as an aside uh, uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic and there was a, a, a very interesting a Lego model of the chart of the nuclides uh, which uh, I highly recommend searching out on YouTube if you can, because it gives a, a sense of scale of the number of different materials that we're thinking about with these reactors. Now, the thing is, this data was originally all created and put together mostly back in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, and we didn't have the resources or capacity at that time to go and make all of the measurements on all of the different channels, on all of the different cross sections for all of the different nuclides. So we prioritise the ones that are most relevant to the reactors at the time. And that has stood us in good stead for our current generation of reactors. The data we have to underpin those reactors is well understood, well characterised, uh, and we can be quite sure of it. And that's because it's gone through uh, this nuclear data life cycle that's on the left. In the nuclear data life cycle, we have quite a rigid process by how we process and bring data together in a coherent manner. 
So we start by identifying a need, and then we make measurements using those experiments that I showed on the, the couple of slides before. And then we go through a process called uh, of compilation and evaluation. So the compilation is about how we bring all those experimental uh, results into a database, uh, like you saw on a couple of slides ago, which has the 24, 25,000 different experimental runs in it. So we compile it into a big database. Uh, and then at the moment, uh, we hand it over to some uh, very skilled, uh, uh, incredibly bright uh, people called nuclear data evaluators. And a nuclear data evaluator has a strong understanding of how these experiments run and is able to essentially make mass weighted averages and weighted averages on the different experiments of one channel cross section. Uh, so what they take is they, they'll capture all of the um, experiments that have been uh, run on a certain channel uh, and they'll they'll look at them all uh, and they'll make some more significant based on the quality of the experiment and this is about understanding the experimental parameters or maybe and that could include the age of the uh, the measurement uh, or the type of equipment that was used to make the measurement and they'll reduce some in the weighting uh, based on uh, perhaps being an older measurement or a measurement that was made by uh, uh, a uh, less experienced team uh, that is likely to have higher uncertainty in it. And they use that to make an evaluation. That sounds simple when we're talking about one uh, nuclide, but actually most of these experiments that we're talking about make something called differential measurements. And a differential measurement essentially means that you're making multiple cross sections on multiple different nuclides at one time. And so we get a codependence on these different experiments. And so the evaluator's skill is that they can understand those codependencies and how they all fit together. But you can start to see how this starts to become a, a quite unwieldy process because they've got to understand how all these different interactions fit together uh, and interact with each other to be able to make a reliable evaluation. That evaluation process uh, uh, takes many years it, and it takes uh, uh, many, many years to train someone up to be able to do that and to understand everything uh, to, to a suitable level. But to check the evaluation's been done in a suitable way, we then go through processing. So we format all that data for use in some of our codes. And then we go through validation. And this is where we come back to our experiments and we take all the data and the codes that we've got. We run the codes, we see what the computational models predict, uh, and we take some experiments of the same models. So for example, we uh, might take some fuel from uh, a reactor and some used fuel from a, a reactor and uh, make some measurements of what is the actual contents of that spent fuel using some of those advanced facilities that we've talked about before. And then we'll compare that to the results of what we get. And, and that's one of the, the, the tasks that my team at NNL does. We look at the comparison of our computational codes with these experiments. And our computational codes in this case are spent fuel inventory codes. And what a spent fuel inventory code is doing is it's setting up uh, a, a partial differential equation across about two and a half thousand nuclides for about 5,000 different reaction probabilities. And it's using all the nuclear data available to input the probabilities of those uh, reactions and then calculate the likely contents of that fuel after a certain amount of time. And the accuracy on these codes it is surprisingly, surprisingly good. Uh, for most of the nuclides, we are sub 1% accurate. Uh, so the uncertainty on those uh, measurements is less than 1%. Uh, because over many, many years, we've been going through this process of identifying, measuring, compiling, evaluating, and validating and publishing. However, for those new materials and those new technologies, as I mentioned, the nuclear data is less well defined and we have uncertainties on that nuclear data that are greater. So what we have to do is we have to keep going through this process as we start identifying new materials to put in reactors or put in different applications to identify the new measurements that are required, make those measurements keep compiling and keep evaluating. But as you can imagine, the challenge of evaluation is getting greater and greater because actually we have the tools now that we can uh, collate more and more data together and have uh, tens of gigabytes of experimental data that we're feeding together. Uh, 
Next slide gives you a bit of an example of the, the scale of data. This is uh, the what's called the reaction channel data for a single nuclide. And all these colored squares indicate that there is a, an evaluated measurement for that channel uh, in a certain nuclear data library. Uh, so you can see there are probably around uh, 50 to 60 uh, 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 different squares that are, that are colored up. It's not quite a, a linear scale across the bottom. Uh, and multiply that by potentially two and a half thousand nuclides. And the fact that we have the computational power nowadays to try and automate a lot of this, um, what we actually see is that we've got a, a in my opinion, a massive big data challenge. We go back to the, the question before, we've got large sporadic data sets, write-ups of experiments, uh, information about the experimental context and the results of the experiment that we're trying to bring together to then produce a, a complex set of interdependent results that allow us to go and do other work. So it's this processing of that nuclear data that becomes quite complex. And this is a challenge that is slow to adapt. One of the big things with uh, the nuclear industry is you don't want to adapt too quickly. Uh, and because once we've got a reactor operating, once we're sure it's operating, we don't want to change too much around how we're doing that. So what we start to do is we start to look at both operating our existing nuclear data, our existing codes for our existing reactors for tens of years. So some of the codes we operate in my team at NNL have been uh, supporting plant operations for 30 or 40 years. And the core code hasn't changed much in that time. But as we get new plant ideas and new designs coming online, what we don't want to do is go and reuse that really old code and really old data. So we're starting to see a lot uh, uh, how we can support these new, new fuel cycles. And this here summarizes uh, the nuclear fuel cycle. I'm not going to go through it in detail, uh, but uh, the key stuff in the middle is we're sort of seeing advances in nuclear fuel fabrication and uh, particularly also in how we recycle that nuclear fuel. And so we're looking at ways we can collect that data and also how we can start looking at applying some of those big data techniques to uh, our complex nuclear data set. And this is really the, the, the start of uh, understanding for us. Uh, but in the past few months, we've actually started looking at how we can apply things like techniques like machine learning uh, to uh, nuclear data. Uh, and there's been significant work, uh, uh, particularly in the US, looking at how machine learning could be used to make the calculation of all these different reaction channels uh, more straightforward. But I said before that this isn't just something to care about because of the nuclear fuel cycle and nuclear reactors. This affects a large array of different scientific endeavours. And one of the biggest areas that it affects is astrophysics. So much of our knowledge of stellar evolution comes from careful computational modelling. And at a mechanistic scale, that modelling obviously needs to consider what happens when atoms are forced together under high pressure. Where does that data come from? The nuclear data, of course. So again, the probabilities of those different atoms, such as the hydrogen atoms, uh, uh, interacting and fusing uh, under high pressures are measurements that we can make using nuclear data experiments and go through that evaluation process to create internally consistent libraries that we can then reliably use to model uh, these technologies and understand what's happening in stellar evolution. And a bit closer to home, uh, in underpinning healthcare. Interestingly, around a third of modern medical treatments depend on radiation and radioisotopes uh, nowadays. Uh, and those treatments include particularly radiotherapy for cancer, some diagnostic tests or sterilization of equipment. Uh, and example, one common diagnostic isotope is molybdenum 99, uh, which decays to technetium 99M. This is generated as a fission product in a reactor uh, uh, a lot of the time. Uh, there are other proposed methods of generating it, such as here we see on the right, an electron beam generating X-rays uh, that is uh, causing the ejection of a neutron from the molybdenum 100 to create molybdenum 99, which then decays to the technetium 99M. To understand how quickly we can create this molybdenum 99, 
again, we go back to the nuclear data that gives us those probabilities. But equally, to understand that the molybdenum 99 and then the technetium 99M is safe and appropriate to inject into humans uh, is a question that we uh, have to go back to the nuclear data. To understand how energetic the radiation coming out of it is, and therefore how much damage that they may cause to the tissues around it. So researching the nuclear data helps us to explore new treatments, uh, as well as safely deliver existing treatments. Uh, and as I mentioned before, a lot of the data for items that we're not currently using is, may, is more poorly underpinned and more poorly defined. So there's a real opportunity in some of the nuclear data research that we look at that we could start to identify uh, new isotopes that can be used for some of these uh, treatments, new isotopes that we can create using accelerators or nuclear reactors or other techniques uh, that cause potentially less damage to the human body once they're injected or can be used for more specific purposes uh, and improve the quality of the healthcare we can give each other. So hopefully in the last 50 minutes or so, I've taken you on a whirlwind tour of information about how nuclear reactors work, how we depend on nuclear data to underpin and understand how those nuclear reactors work, how we start to create that nuclear data, and how that nuclear data affects so many other things around us, from the operation of a smoke detector to the healthcare that we all receive, and how bringing all that data together and how bringing uh, the understanding of that data together and all the experiments that feed into that data together is perhaps the original big data challenge that we've been working on for the past 60 or 70 years. Uh, and with that, I'll hand back over to Scott. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, normally at this point, I would, of course, ask our physics centre to, to give you a rapturous round of applause. As they can't speak or turn their mics on, you won't be able to hear that, but I'll give you my own personal uh, thank you and round of applause. Um, so this is the opportunity, ladies and gents. Alan's done superbly for time. So we've got five or ten minutes. I've got three questions already queued up for Alan, so we'll go through those shortly. Um, but if you haven't done before, please do just pop a question if you've got one um, in the questions box. That will come through to me and I'll send that uh, verbally to Alan very shortly. OK, so I'll leave that for, for those of you to, to pop into the question box. Whilst we do that, Alan, I'm going to pose you the first few questions. And, and you may have alluded to the answer actually in the second half. So thank you, Alex, for sending this question in. And he says, hi, Alan, lovely talk so far. Uh, I'm a fellow nuclear physicist slash materials scientist. Have you got a favourite nuclear database? Wow. Um, and, and why? For example, uh, NUDAT or Nuclide, Lara or Janice? That seems very, um, perhaps that's a very nuclear physics -y thing to ask. I don't know. I'll hand it over to you, Alan, to answer that one. Uh, 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 it is a very nuclear physicist thing to, to ask, to, admittedly, uh, uh, but I do have an answer. Uh, okay. uh, I'm a, 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 maybe a bit of a traditionalist, uh, uh, and I uh, always go for GEF, which is the Joint European Fission and Fusion File. Uh, so that's the European project to make one of the main nuclear data files that allows us to model reactor operations. Um, uh, the latest version of GEF is a, a version called GEF 3.3, but actually the version we use most often uh, in the nuclear industry uh, is a version called GEF 2.2, which was released back in the late 1990s. Uh, uh, but one of the great things about GEF 2.2 is it's got lots and lots of validation data against it. So when we use GEF 2.2 to model those existing processes, we can be really sure that the results are fairly accurate. Uh, and that's why I quite like GEF 2.2. Maybe old, but it's dependable. Nothing wrong with that at all, Alan. Brilliant. OK, um, this is an interesting one. Um, and thank you to C. Scott for sending this in. Are similar big data techniques used in fusion reactors such as the tokamak? I don't know if you'll know the answer to that, Alan, but um, if you do, we'd love to hear it. I think one of the first things to highlight is that nuclear data is a cross cutting uh, area of research between fission and fusion. Uh, and uh, I alluded it to there in a bit, the Joint European Fission and Fusion file. Really, it, a lot of the data that is required to model both a tokamak and uh, an existing fission reactor uh, is a lot of the same fundamental data. There are certain differences in the data. Uh, for example, the speed of the neutrons flying out of a tokamak uh, uh, around 14 to 20 times uh, the speed of neutrons uh, flying out of a, a fission event. 
uh, but it is the same databases uh, that, are, that are used to underpin that. And actually, we collaborate quite a lot with uh, our colleagues in the Fusion community to understand their needs. Uh, and within that process, that actually happens at kind of an international level. Uh, we are uh, collaborating across the fission and fusion world to prioritise experiments in the fission and fusion world uh, because we have to bring in the, the needs of all the different sectors uh, to, to be able to, to produce libraries that are, are most useful. So I hope that answers your question. Superb, Adam, brilliant. And actually, that, that kind of leads us uh, reasonably nicely, actually, into the next question. So thank you, John, for sending this in. And he's asked, uh, do the neutrinos released from the fission reaction play any part in the reaction or do they just go straight through the reactor walls to join the billions from the sun? Um, so you've you've identified correctly there that they, they don't really do much. Uh, they do go straight through the reactor walls and uh, join the billions out there. However, uh, if my colleague were here, he'd get very excited uh, at this point in time as uh, he is doing a lot of research on the, fish, the neutrino generation rate within reactors. And the reason they're interested in the neutrino generation rate within reactors is because those neutrinos go through the walls and go through the rock uh, without really interacting with a lot. Uh, there is a concept that's being worked on and developed uh, around the world around using anti-neutrino detectors to detect the operation of reactors. Now, this becomes interesting, as you may have seen in the news. There are countries around the world uh, that uh, ha are operating nuclear facilities for various different purposes. And if you want to verify uh, how a nuclear facility is being operated in an independent way, some of these anti-neutrino detectors offer a really interesting way to go and put your own kit in a country, maybe a few miles from a reactor, and just sit there and watch what happens and watch the rate of neutrinos uh, and potentially see an uptick in neutrinos uh, to detect the reactor operations. Uh, so there's, there's really interesting research being done around the world on that at the moment. Thank you. Alan. Yeah, that's really interesting. Actually, I wasn't aware of that. Um, we've got, by the looks of it, three questions left, which I think will be perfect for timing. So um, the first of which is from Colin. So thank you, Colin. Uh, but thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Uh, you mentioned one of the experiments containing a neutron accelerator. But how do you accelerate neutrons since they have no charge? That's a very good question. Um, a neutron accelerator is probably a bit of a, a misnomer in the way I describe it there. But we generate uh, neutrons with kinetic uh, energy and so uh, momentum uh, in a couple of different ways. But you're right in identifying that we don't directly accelerate the neutron. Uh, one of the primary ways that this is done uh, is through uh, spallation on a target. So in that case, we take uh, most likely a proton and we accelerate the proton. Uh, which obviously we can do, uh, and we fire that at a, a target of a different sort. So quite often that's a lithium target. And if you fire a proton at high energy on a lithium target, you generate a significant number of neutrons. And the higher the energy of the proton, the higher the number of high energy neutrons you generate. Uh, there are some really interesting facilities around the world that, that do this. Uh, so uh, there's a uh, uh, a facility being built in Sweden, uh, in London, Sweden, called the European Spallation Source, uh, which is doing this uh, to generate neutrons of hundreds of mega electron volts. Uh, so for context, uh, the neutron released from a nuclear fission reaction is around one mega electron volt before it's slowed down to that point where it can interact again in a fission reactor. The neutrons released from a tokamak are 14.1 MeV. And actually, that brings us on to one of the other major sources of neutrons and accelerators is what's known as a deuterium tritium accelerator. And in a DT accelerator or a DD accelerator, so a deuterium deuterium accelerator, we take an ionized uh, stream of deuterium ions. We accelerate those uh, and we smash them into uh, uh, either a cloud of tritium or a cloud of uh, deuterium which obviously actually helps us generate fusion reactions at a much lower rate than we get in a tokamak mind, but generate a significant number of neutrons. What's useful about those neutrons is they really enable us to do some of the experiments and measurements that are needed for the fusion uh, community. 
so they have a very specific requirement around measurements at 14 mega electron volts because that's the neutrons that are generated in their system so they need to be able to do the experiments at that, that uh, energy uh, to then scale up to what does that look like for a whole tokamak thank you alan that's great um actually what well, well, that leads on nicely to, to a materials question actually so this is the penultimate one and uh, thank you neil for sending that in he asks uh, when we were using molybdenum 99 i don't know in what context that is neil so i apologize uh, but when we were using molybdenum 99 for manufacturing uh, there were issues getting hold of the raw material have times moved on uh, are there new ways of manufacturing it uh you are correct in identifying it's a big challenge it, one of the significant challenges that actually faces the world uh, at the moment uh, is the generation of molybdenum 99 so most molybdenum 99 around the world is generated in research reactors there has been a lot of work looking at different ways of generating it and trying to move to more accelerator based technologies for generating molybdenum 99 one of the big challenges for molybdenum 99 uh, is its major production routes are neutron dependent so therefore the best way to generate a significant amount of it is in a high neutron flux field uh, and the best high neutron flux uh, fields that we have in the world right now are nuclear fission reactors uh, because they have the, that neutron flux starting at the order of 10 to the 15 and going up as we get to the center of the core and so that's why we use research reactors some of the highest sort of neutron flux accelerators we can get hold of on a commercial basis that aren't really kind of used for experimental time stuff but more for production uh, methods uh, exist in the world of maybe 10 to the 12 to 10 to the 14 neutrons per second per centimeter square uh, so the uh, number of accelerators we need to generate the same amount of material is obviously greater there's a lot of research going on in this. There's a really interesting company that uh, you might want to check out called Shine Medical Technologies in the US that have developed an accelerator technology uh, alongside a, uh, a specialized liquid core uh, that is designed to increase the generation of molybdenum 99. But I said before, this is a, a key issue in the world. One of the, the issues is that the research reactors that generate this molybdenum 99 are slowly shutting down throughout the world. Uh, there was a significant uh, reduction in capacity a few years ago when a, a reactor in Canada uh, shut down. Uh, and luckily at that time, an, another reactor in Australia uh, started up uh, to increase production capacity. Uh, but currently total world production capacity from Molly 99, molybdenum 99, is maybe 120, 130% of world demand. Uh, and uh, a number of those reactors are due to shut down in the next four to five years. Uh, and the case for building a research reactor is really difficult because molybdenum 99 uh, isn't really sold at a commercial pricing uh, to be able to recoup the costs of running the reactor. So what tends to happen is you need to find additional experimental programs that you're gonna run with the reactor uh, to justify the uh, the cost of generating the molybdenum 99 where you'll probably just about recoup the processing costs from the reactor uh, because the reactor generates uh, what you might call a fuzzier uh, uh, array of materials coming out of the back of it so you need to do more processing to clean that up and just get the molybdenum 99 before you ship it to the hospitals uh, whereas the accelerators uh, being proposed are proposed to maybe produce cleaner uh, outputs that require less processing before uh, moving to patients. As in every era, and there's always that sort of cost versus scientific endeavour trade-off, isn't there? Uh, but what that, what that does nicely do is bring us to our final question. We've we've almost gone full circle. We started with questions on the very microscopic, and we're going actually back out now to to the macroscopic. Uh, and thank you, uh, Alex, for asking this. Is but aside from uranium nitride, uh, are your group looking at any other novel fuel compounds? Do you think mixed oxide fuels may make a comeback? Any thoughts on thorium for us using this fuel? Uh, the answer to that is it all depends on the reactor we're operating it in. And there is research on mixed oxide fuels. Uh, 
the nature of the research on mixed oxide fuels is that it's more for fast reactor scenarios though. So mixed oxide uh, fuels have been uh, proposed a lot as particularly a way to um, use up a significant amount of plutonium stockpile that exists in the UK. Uh, and mixed oxide fuels contain a significant amount of plutonium 239, which is fissionable in the fast spectrum rather than the thermal spectrum. Uh, and that's why they're particularly proposed uh, for the, um, uh, uh, the fast reactors uh, that are being proposed. So there is research ongoing in, in NNL and as part of the uh, advanced fuel cycle programme about how we would manufacture mixed oxide fuels in, in the future. Mixed oxide fuels are a really complex uh, thing to manufacture and put together. Uh, and it's more about how we can scale up the manufacturing processes uh, to, a, again, a, a point that is commercial. One of the uh, things that I quite find quite fascinating about the position I get to, to look at from NNL is we sit on that kind of interface between science and industry. Um, we have to understand a lot about how some of these processes might work brilliantly, brilliantly at a lab scale, but how do we scale that up to a, a production facility that can produce tons of this fuel a year? Uh, and uh, that's that's the challenges we're looking at now uh, with research into the mixed oxide fuels. Uh, but for the current generation light water reactors, uh, mixed oxide fuel is of less interest. Uh, there is still a reason that mixed oxide fuel used in France, where they did close the fuel cycle there, uh, but not in the UK. Brilliant, Alan. That's the, that's it. Superb. So first and foremost, can I just thank you, Alan, on behalf of everybody that's attended tonight. Um, I've certainly enjoyed it. And even though I am, a, I guess, uh, an atomistic modeler at heart, I've learned a great deal this evening. So thank you very much for that. Obviously, thank you again to Stephen for his uh, interpretation. I've got two very quick things to ask of our audience before you go. Um, just in the chat function, I've put the sign up link to our mailing list. So if you want to receive future um, communications about our upcoming lectures, that's the easiest way to receive them. Um, and just a very final reminder that our final lecture of this programme is on the 18th, that's 18th of March, um, and it's Rosella Benetti who's given the talk, and Rosella looks like she's in the list of attendees tonight, so thank you for coming along Rosella, I very much look forward to meeting you and all of you again next month for our final uh, talk. So have a lovely evening and I'll see you all again soon, bye for now. Thank you Alan. See you there, Ron. This is the funny bit where I try to work.